And so, friends, without further ado, I would uh, like to invite now Bishop uh, Gulli to share with us her keynote address. Bishop Gulli, please. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. It is very good to be here with you, and it goes without saying that it is, of course, a huge honor to address you in this plenary. The subject of interfaith relationships touches most, if not all of us, in some shape or form, because as we've heard, we live in a pluralist society with people of all faiths and none. But our vastly varied contexts means that our thinking and our responses will probably be very different from one another. I speak out of my own particular context and experiences, which relate especially to Christian-Muslim relations. But I hope that some of the themes that I'm going to touch on will be helpful to others of you, if nothing else, to stimulate thinking and discussion. So let me begin, if I may, with a little bit about my own life story so that you can place what I say within the context of my story. Although I'm now a bishop in the Church of England, I started life in Iran where I was born and grew up. It was in the tiny Anglican community there that the seeds of my early faith were planted. My father was a Muslim convert from a small village in the center of the country. And by the time that I was born, he was already bishop of this fledgling diocese of Iran. And my mother, the daughter and granddaughter of British missionaries, was herself born and raised in Iran. So I lived an unusual life between and betwixt the worlds of Islam and Christianity, Persian and English, and Eastern and Western influences. This unusual childhood was what I considered normal. And for the most part, my two worlds of school and wider society on one hand and home and church life on the other coexisted reasonably peaceably and there was some occasional overlap. But all of that changed as the events which led eventually to the Islamic Revolution of 1979 began to unfold. At school, I began to be ostracized both by friends and by teachers. And at home, the church was coming under increasing pressure. Over a period of around 18 months, our institutions, such as hospitals and schools, were forcibly taken over or closed. Church offices and the bishop's house were ransacked, raided, and confiscated. The church's financial assets were frozen one of our clergy was found murdered in his study. And my father was briefly imprisoned before an attack on his life in which he survived, but my mother was injured. But for us as a family, events culminated in the murder of my brother in the spring of 1980, when he was 24 years old. His car was ambushed on his way back from work, and he was shot in the head, and he died instantly. My father was out of the country at the time for meetings, but although never anyone was, no one was ever brought to justice, we've always understood that my brother was targeted because of his association with the church and simply because he was his father's son. After the funeral, my mother and my sister and I joined my father here in England, assuming that we'd be back home within a few weeks or months. But of course, that was not to be. And so having arrived here originally as a refugee, aged 14, here I still am, over 40 years later now, um, and a British citizen. <laughs> My, 
My father continued working as bishop in Iran in exile until his retirement, and he dedicated his life to supporting and encouraging Christians still in Iran, and working with Persians, both Christian and Muslim, in this country. And in particular, he dedicated his time to writing and translating Christian literature in Persian. During his episcopate, he attended three Lambeth conferences, but both my parents have now died, and the diocese in Iran is extremely isolated and currently without a bishop. So these formative experiences have shaped my thinking and they continue to inform my understanding of how we as Christians engage with other faiths, especially when elements within those faiths wish us harm. It's not easy and it hasn't been straightforward, but it's involved for me embracing the concept of paradox. That ability to hold together apparent contradictions to help us navigate the way faithfully through what is often rough terrain. For example, I have known Islam both as a great civilization, which over the centuries has gifted to the world some of the greatest scientific advances, architectural designs, poetic and literary masterpieces, and spiritual insights. The photo that you now see on your screen is the only one I have of me with my grandfather, a godly and wonderful Muslim man of deep faith. But I have also known Islam as a force which has done my family and the church in Iran great harm. It is difficult, but necessary somehow, to hold both these threads together and to remember that the evils which have befallen the church are not a reflection on the whole Islamic faith. In the words of the late, great Kenneth Cragg, whilst certainly an Islam was guilty, nevertheless, the Islam that is indicated in what befell the Persian church might have stayed its hand by councils no less claiming its name. So, what impact has this way of thinking had on my encounters with Muslims in the West? Well, I try to see the best, to be respectful, to learn and understand more deeply. And alongside this, I've also sought to be honest, to tell the story of the church in Iran and to ask respectfully and gently if they are willing to condemn this element of their faith, even as we condemn the Christianity that fought the Crusades, for example, or which shows itself in some of the far-right politics of the Western world today. These are attempts to hold together in tension both the Christian call to forgiveness and to justice. And these are immense and complex themes which we don't have time to engage with further now. But let me just say that my story and experiences, indeed those of all of us, sit today within the context of the theme of this plenary, which is hospitality and generosity and against the backdrop of today's Bible passage from 1 Peter chapter 4, which itself holds the importance of hospitality and generosity alongside the reality of suffering and persecution. It's important to note that Peter doesn't glorify suffering for its own sake, and neither does he suggest that it should be endured passively. Again, this relates to the call for Christians to act and speak for justice wherever and whenever possible. Nevertheless, Peter also reminds his small community that they shouldn't be surprised by the suffering that they're undergoing because Christ himself suffered. And in that sense, suffering is the default for any Christian community. Indeed, perhaps the norm for Christianity is that it should be persecuted and we should be worried when we're not experiencing persecution. 
And Peter encourages his community and us to associate any suffering we undergo because of faith with the suffering of Christ, thereby finding comfort and even joy in its midst. In a mysterious way, suffering can take us closer to Christ. This is how my father described it at the height of the revolution in Iran. The way of the cross, he said, has suddenly become so meaningful that we have willingly walked in it with our Lord near us. Our numbers have become smaller, our earthly supports have gone, but we are learning the meaning of faith in new and deeper ways. So this is part of our thinking as Christians and should permeate our practice when we're seeking to relate to people of other faiths, even when they may be wishing us harm. The paradox is that whilst there is injustice which must be spoken out against, the suffering is also taking us closer to Christ and is part of our calling as people of faith. Put this then alongside the themes of hospitality and generosity, both in 1 Peter 4, but also in much developed Anglican theology around interfaith relations, and most especially perhaps in the document Generous Love that was endorsed by Lambeth 2008. Now, it is right to acknowledge that the proper reading of 1 Peter 4 relates more specifically to hospitality within the church family. And yet, there are many scriptural passages and theological traditions that help us expand this familial imperative to one that Christians through the church extend to the wider world. God's love and generous hospitality demonstrated through the inner life of the Trinity draws us in and sends us forth to do likewise. This is how generous love expresses it. And I quote, our pressing need to renew our relationships with people of different faiths must be grounded theologically in our understanding of the reality of the God who is Trinity. Father, Son, and Spirit abide in one another in a life which is a dynamic, eternal, and unending movement of self-giving. In our meeting with people of different faiths, we are called to mirror however imperfectly, this dynamic of sending and abiding. So our encounters lead us deeper into the very heart of God and strengthen our resolve for interfaith engagement. And this, of course, has resonances with Kenneth Cragg's life and work in which he emphasized the need for Christians to learn to be both hosts and guests with all the power imbalances and paradoxes which that involves. Craig wrote, we find ourselves guests at God's banquet. You spread a table for me, was how the psalmist saw it, speaking of the very landscape as a scene of hospitality. We then have a pattern of relating where the church can be both host and guest, shaped and embraced within the hospitality of the Godhead. The wide diversity of engagements with other religious traditions that are represented in this room will emphasize different elements of interfaith relations, including dialogue, work for the common good, witness and evangelism. Each of you will have important insights that somehow need to be held in tension together for the fullest and richest understanding. For some, the priority will be dialogue, which seeks deeper understanding and works towards the common good. People of faith seeking peace and reconciliation and looking to make the world a better place. For others, this may be a far cry from your experiences. 
Under the Islam of present-day Iran, Persian Christians are guilty of apostasy and their legal, their legal status as a church is unrecognized. So how can a body that doesn't even exist engage in dialogue? Christians are charged with the mission to share their faith with their neighbors. This means that they cannot be closed communities, but ones which reach outwards. But how to do this when you're in a, a minority who is fearful for your existence? Is it possible to dialogue with those who persecute you? Well, yes and no. If dialogue means conversation between equal partners based on mutual respect and understanding, then no. But if the urge to dialogue is a Christian impetus to be fully present and Christ-like, then yes. To have confidence in one's faith whilst continuing to try to understand the other more fully, that is a kind of dialogue. And when the situation arises, by offering the hand of friendship based on generosity and forgiveness, that too is dialogue in action. And it is the kind of dialogue that Anglicans in Iran have participated in for much of their history. In other contexts, there are possibilities to work collaboratively for areas of shared concern, for the common good, and for the peace of the world. The COVID pandemic, tackling climate change, and indeed the very cause of religious freedom can provide huge opportunities for partnerships across faith communities. These are valuable and they should be pursued wherever possible. But to those who are fortunate enough in relative safety to be able to engage in such fruitful relationships, I would gently say Always remember your brothers and sisters around the world who are suffering persecution. Do not forget them. And do not be silent in the face of their reality. I'd like to share an excerpt in English translation from just one of the many letters that I've received over the years from Iranian Christians who are fearful and desperate. Having described his plight and that of his son, Ismail writes this. I am aghast at the community of Christians sitting on their hands, not raising a finger to act, but only observing and praying. They do not do anything in the face of the evil going on. They say there is nothing they can do apart from pray. The only sympathetic phrase we keep hearing is, oh dear, what a shame. On hearing our stories, such as those who are executed or imprisoned or tortured, they repeat the same phrase so often that it becomes normal. In the words of scripture, their hard hearts are hardened. The hard-hearted ones who have been saved. This is no salvation. I don't want to judge, but the God who said, I was sick and you did not visit me, is unlikely to thank them for failing to act. I feel helpless and powerless and impotent in response to this letter. What can I possibly say or do for Ismail? But I carry the letter around with me and I share it when I can as a constant reminder not to become immune to the suffering of others even as my context in Britain allows me the freedom to build good relationships with Muslims and people of all faiths. And so what of witness and evangelism? This too is a Christian calling to be lived out graciously, gently, authentically, both in words and actions. And it has nothing in my way of thinking, to do with standing on street corners and shouting Bible verses at passers-by. But it's about the forging of meaningful relationships that cultivate the possibility for sharing faith through deep and honest engagement. 
Again, context is everything. And so witness and evangelism will look different in different places. And in some parts of the world may not be possible in the way that we fully understand them. But let's be honest and admit that for many of us, in the West at least, the barriers are nothing to do with safety or fear of persecution, but more to do with our own embarrassment, our misplaced fear of offending others, and our lack of commitment in developing those deep relationships of trust. As I draw to a close, I want our final thought to be for those Christians who live as minorities in often hostile and dangerous environments. Many years ago now, I read an article by Bernhard Reitzmar, and it's called Strangers in the Light, and it's always remained with me. He suggests that there are generally two possibilities for those who are persecuted, to withdraw from the world or to fight for the right to ring the church bells, as he puts it, and live with the consequences. But neither approach, he su suggests, is quite in keeping with the gospel. So what is the alternative? Surviving as a threatened minority, claims Reitzmar, is only possible in the context of a strong community. The challenge then is neither to fight nor to flee, but to build a vibrant, living, true community that becomes God's new society and seeks to engage with the world around it as best it can. In words from today's Bible passage, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 19, let those suffering in accordance with God's will entrust themselves to a faithful creator while continuing to do good. Perhaps this is something we would all do well to remember and to live by, no matter what our context. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Bishop Goody, for that very powerful, very insightful, yet uh, uh, extremely challenging message to us all. Uh, 